from Microbe TV. This is Immune, episode number nine, recorded on June 20th, 2018. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you are listening to the podcast about the body's defenders against disease. Joining me today from Ithaca, New York, Cindy Leifer. Hi, welcome. Immuners? Do we say immuners? Have we decided what we call ourselves yet? Whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> welcome back for another episode. Just don't call me late for dinner. <laughs> That's how it goes, right? I think so. I've never, you know, in my adult life, I've never been told to come to dinner. Oh, I thought you were going to say in your adult life, you've never been late. <laughs> oh, yeah, I've been late. But I try not to be, but not late for dinner because we never had a, <laughs> we never had dinner together. Everyone always has their own dinner. Uh, yeah. That's it's the weird. modern family, right? That's right. Also joining us from Worcester, Ohio, Steph Langle. Hey there. Yep. Uh, things are going well here in Worcester. It's like 77 degrees, pretty humid. It's, it was really hot last last week into the mid 90s. But it, two days ago, we it. had almost 100. It was very, very hot. Yeah. Was it humid too? It was. It was, it was <laughs> terrible. I hate to complain, but I'm not. I mean, I like the cold. So, but, yeah. you know, we'll always complain about weather because it's a What do you want to call us? Oh, I immuners. Am immuners. Our listeners have come up with some pretty good things, I think, throughout our emails. I'll have to peruse them and see if I can find Immuners is good. That's fine. You can, uh, yeah, I mean, you can let them write in for a few more months and see what happens. Yeah, yeah, we'll have a little, maybe we'll have a contest. There's and one, give away. <clears throat> one over, yes. over on Twip. We have uh, one of my favorites is Twip Panasoms. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. great. Isn't that a good one? <laughs> Before we go into our paper today, I wanted to. Um, I went. I was over at uh, iTunes today. I'm looking at other science podcasts. We have Twiv number five hundred next week, and I was going. That oh, I know. I heard that. Right. I was looking to see how many other science podcasts have gone five hundred or more episodes, and there aren't many. But I tell you, there are a lot of science podcasts out there. There's a lot of competition for ears. <laughs> anyway, I went to Immune on iTunes to see the ratings because we have 29 ratings. We have 27 five-star ratings, one four-star rating, and one one-star rating. Oh, no. Maybe uh -oh. they were confused. Maybe they most, of the, most, people, most people like it, except there's one person who is Bucky62738 says, this podcast is very one-sided when they discuss politics. Not every oh. not every scientist is a liberal and has your one sided ideology. Please stop talking about politics and keep to science behind stuff. After all, you don't have degrees in economics and political science. To which I would like to respond: When politics impinges science, we have to talk about it. I agree. It doesn't matter that we don't have political science or economic degrees. That's just a, a reason for you to say not to talk about it, frankly. But <laughs> if the president is cutting the NIH budget, we will talk about it. The president is saying vaccines are bad. We will talk about it, right? I think it's our job. There is no separating politics and science, right? And the other thing is, is we're not just uh, we're not just putting opinions out there. This, this is backed up, you know. I mean, the effects of uh, cutting NIH funding is is directly on research, which is what we're supporting for sure. And and I'm a proponent of vaccines. You know, if if there are policies that come out against vaccination, and, and we believe based on our scientific knowledge and the evidence that's out there that this is the right thing to do, we need to speak up. Yeah, it's not about being liberal or not. It's just about the right thing to do. That's correct. I I don't. I mean, it's not it's not whether it's uh, left side or right side. It's it's whether we believe based on the scientific evidence and our experience that it's right or wrong. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, it's interesting. I mean, there are a lot of topics that are hot button topics that I have seen, re I mean, from both sides. So if you consider GMOs for one, um, that I mean, both conservative, liberal, there's people who don't, they're misinformed across the board. Vaccines, same thing. So we're going to talk about it. And the and for that particular listener, I mean, the combined amount of time we maybe mentioned something is like, such a small percent if you don't want to if you can't handle it you know you're so worked <laughs> fast up fast forward fast forward we got good stuff here you'll be fine so i noticed i went over to meet the microbiologist which is a uh, 
interview style podcast by Julie Wolf. She's at ASM. And Bucky had a comment there. <laughs> and this is great. Bucky seems upset. Bucky says, there is no annoying chatter or talk about the weather. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's what he said on that about that podcast? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so he's upset he's, about pol- or she about yeah, politics and, and the weather, which we talk about mostly. We don't do too much here, but on, no. on Twiv we do. <laughs> but some people just get cranky, you know. And here we are. We're doing this for your pleasure and learning, right? <laughs> we're not doing it to make money or to advance ourselves. or It's because we love science. So it's just funny when you get that kind of criticism. But that's fine. We It, it has to just flow off of our backs as if we were ducks, right? <laughs> quack, quack. Something like that. That's how it goes. I, on Twiv, I often get emails about politics as well. And, uh, yeah. But I can't. I think the science and politics are intertwined because our money, NIH money, comes from the government. It's taxpayer money that's appropriated by the president and Congress. So it's intertwined. There's no way around it. And even uh, what did Einstein said, I, uh, science and politics cannot be separated. Let me that's see. right. He's got there a- is a famous quote by him, yeah. Yeah. Do they complain about your, the weather chatter on Twiv? Some people do. Some people yeah. don't like it. Yeah. But you know, the funny thing is that many people, when they write, they'll go, hello, the weather here in Chicago is. <laughs> oh. right? so, but you know, it's a, it's an icebreaker. It's something that you, you expect. It's kind of a transition of whatever else you're doing going into that. I'm I curious. did have a, su- a suggestion, and maybe we could implement it as our weather update. But somebody asked, like, they're not in science. They said, well, what, like, what do you do? do all day you know what this week are you up to so we could say today you know i don't know yeah, people like the stories of what we do what are you doing I, today I, steph are you, are you meeting pigs, yeah. meeting pigs today? <laughs> we do have yep we bled baby piglets this morning we spun down the serum and i'll be running antibody uh eliza's tomorrow so that's what i about you cindy Oh, I was actually doing experiments. Uh, I have a new rotation student um, who's fabulous. And uh, we were staining some cells, teaching him how to do immunofluorescent microscopy. So we were looking at cells under the microscope. And that's, that's one of my favorite things. You know, when you, when you do a staining and you put it under the microscope and you turn the fluorescence on and things light up and, and you can visually see where things are and how they work. I think it's fabulous. It's so fascinating. So I, I still get excited about that when I do things in the lab. Yeah, I, I changed the CO2 in a nitrogen, liquid nitrogen <laughs> cylinder this morning. That's about my extent. That's so exciting. Lab. And then I spent the rest of the morning arranging uh, guests for future podcasts, like next week in Texas and all the details and the following week, ASV I'm trying to arrange, yeah. trying to arrange our immune at ASV. And I'm thinking this morning, I've almost had it with this arrangement crap. It's tiring. <laughs> I just want to talk about science. I need a tour manager. You you need somebody. You need yeah. a manager to do all this stuff. You I'll did, say, yeah. go get Cindy Life or for Twiv. Go go email her, tell her, and, and figure out a date so I don't have to do with it. You know that kind of thing. Yeah. And you know, I was it's just minor, uh, but it takes a lot of time going back and forth. And this is not. I mean, I just did uh, ASM a couple of podcasts there. I had to re- arrange those ahead of time. One of them, someone canceled at the last minute, so I had to dig up guests at the last minute while I was in Europe for another podcast. Uh, that, that's not really what I want to be doing, but I guess if I want to do these, I have to. Which makes me think, recently I'm thinking, do I need to do all these podcasts? <laughs> don't well, this one. No, I'm not going to. This is brand new. I, I won't drop it. But there's some, <laughs> you know, there's some others. But, well, I guess you could say they're so infrequent that uh, it doesn't matter, but. I don't know. I'm having a little self introspection today. That's what I'm doing. So here, here's the thing. Here's the challenge for our uh, listeners: call in or email in and let Vincent know how important this is, and give him yes. the energy to keep doing this. Or go to Patreon and give money so he can hire somebody so he doesn't feel this way. <laughs> so that would be so. Great. This is the and bottom we can line. More to you. I wish I could hire someone. And in fact, the more the most important thing to me is that I would like these shows to to go on for a long time beyond me, right? So I have to put in place some kind of organization that's independent of any one person, right? And we don't have that in place right now. I mean, if I disappeared tomorrow, all the podcasts right. would stop. 
because nobody can figure out how to do them, right? <laughs> it would take a little while, yeah. It would, yeah. I mean, you guys could probably say, oh, let's record this, figure out how to do it, but you wouldn't know how to get onto the website, right? All right. that stuff. And that's yeah. not good. So I got to have, I got to put something together. So are there, um, are there philanthropies or small grants that one could apply to that would fund something related to science communication that might be useful? Maybe our listeners might know. I have applied for a few in the past. I have applied, I've, I've inquired of um, Howard Hughes, actually wrote someone at the Howard Hughes, an education director, and they said, you, what you're doing is great, but we want to do our own thing. Okay, mm. thank you. I wrote the, the um, there's a foundation here in New York City that funds a lot of communication. Um, they said they only want to do traditional media like radio and film. Mm. <laughs> I've tried NSF. So now my thing is I'm going after uh, donors, people who would have money and say, okay, here's a five-year plan. We need, I don't know, let's say $1 million to hire a couple of people to run the business and make it sustainable in five years. Because, it, because I think if we could build our audience out a little more, we could then get sufficient advertising to sustain it. But I can't do that myself. I need someone to do That's it. That's right. Unless right. I decide to quit, you know, uh, my, my job, but um, I really enjoy it. So I don't want to <laughs> quit at the moment. So at some point I will, but anyway, that's all. Um, not really science, but it's the it's the backstory here, right? Right. We do have a, a a real science story for you today, which was spurred by a visit I made, I don't know, a month or two ago to uh, Emory University in, in Atlanta, uh, and I I met with Max Cooper, and he told me all about <laughs> lampreys mm -hmm. <laughs> and their immune system. Now. Tell you, both of you tell me, Max told me he discovered B cells. Is that right? In the literature, it does say I that. So, Although, yeah. Yeah. I, I think now, was he the one, though, originally in chickens who discovered the IGY? Because I think that that was the original discovery. I don't know, but he... It may be. I had no reason to doubt him. He, right, he's, right. Like, he's like 85 years old. He still has a big he lab. Is. I sat in his yeah. office with him and wow. he told me all about lamprey. Uh, variable <laughs> lymphocyte receptors, and I said we have to do this someday on immune. So today we're going to talk about this. Yeah, I had invited him a few years back <clears throat> here to Cornell, and uh, because I I I had heard about these when I was a postdoc, and I just thought it was the most fascinating thing in comparative immunology, and I I just loved it, and I followed it. And when he came here, he was telling his story about. Um, the B-like cells and the T-like cells, which we'll get into yeah. um, in the lampreys. And I, it's such an interesting um, convergent evolution. It's more than one way to solve a problem of being able to recognize microbial infection and antigens. And I just think it's so cool. Yeah, definitely. And he, he came to my seminar, in fact, sat in the front row and promptly fell asleep. Nope. <laughs> which old people tend to do. Do you know when wow. I was at when I was at NIH, there was an individual who I'll, who I'll leave unnamed for now. But if, if people know of this, they might realize this. It was it's somebody who would sit in the front row and look like they were asleep the entire time. And then when this when the speaker finished, they would raise their hand and ask the single most insightful question you can ever imagine. <laughs> and you were like, "How do they do that?" I've, I've heard of this. I have heard of this. Maybe they're, they're absorbing in their sleep. I don't know. I, yeah, or, I guess. Do you think they're inherently pranksters and they just like to kind of put you off your game and that's the, yeah. they think Maybe, it's fun? Well, some people like to just close their eyes, right? And, right, and, right. Uh, yeah. That way they're not well, distracted. Take all that time to listen. make them slide. It could be. It could be. <laughs> I, I have trouble staying awake, especially when I'm running around a lot. And um, my 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 lab person, Amy, was here in my office he was telling me about some sequencing and i fell asleep right next to her and she said oh are gosh. you are you okay i said yeah but it's a little boring what you're telling me <laughs> i had asked her how much is it going to cost the sequence you know 50 um we have got 50 trachea from wild new york city mice oh wow and we want to see what viruses are in them so i asked her how much it would cost and i w it wasn't really that interesting to know how much it would cost? <laughs> well, I guess at least you're honest. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, if it's really interesting, I'll stay awake. But I don't know. I have trouble staying awake. On, and even in seminars, if it's not so interesting, I'm just tired. When I'm really tired, I'll stand. 
I think. Oh that's a yeah, good idea. that's a good. I'll stand in the back. You can't you can't fall asleep that way, right? Well, if you do, it'll be you very. Can fall over. <laughs> you can fall over. <laughs> that's great. All right, uh, all right. Let's talk about uh, lampreys. First of all, I have a quote from the paper, which I'll tell you about in a moment. Uh, th- this is a wonderful way to start. Quote, immunoglobulins are a crown jewel of jawed vertebrate evolution through recombination and mutation of small numbers of genes. Immunoglobulins can specifically recognize a vast variety of natural and I would say human-made organic molecules. I think that's just a wonderful summary of antibodies, which we've talked about twice on immune number three and number six. So antibodies must be important if we, this is our ninth episode, yeah. and we're talking so about it for one. the third time. Now, wait a minute, three, six, nine, and there's three of us. I think all three of those are you, Vincent, <gasps> <Wow>. right? <laughs> Probably because in each case, it had something to do with viruses. Viruses, yep. I, know, I think one was uh, antibody dependent enhancement. Yep. And the second was the bifunctional antibodies, right? Where you have two specificities. Mm-hmm. Yep. And yep. today, lamprey antibodies we're going to talk about. So that, that little statement, jawed, jawed vertebrates. <laughs> this is a group of animals called the nathostomata, jawed vertebrates. There are 60,000 species, things like cartilaginous fish, bony fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals. And all of these animals, jawed vertebrates, have they have T lymphocytes, they have B lymphocytes, and they use VDJ recombination to create diversity in both T cell receptors and B cell receptors. I think we've touched on that a little bit before, right, in immune? Yeah, we, we have a little bit, yep. Although, but the idea is generally that you have cassettes in the genome that you pick up one cassette and then you put it next to another cassette and you put them together in a specific order to make a gene. So the TCR and BCR, T cell receptor and B cell receptor are the only genes in the genome that are not encoded in a functional gene. Mm. So they have, right. they have to be physically recombined in order to make a functional gene, which is really interesting because you're talking about messing with the DNA and cutting it and pasting it together in different ways, which we don't normally think of that being something that that cells sh- should be doing. But it's important, critical, and um, is normal in a T cell and a B cell, and only in a T cell and a B cell. Now, if you go back 550 million years, I wish I could do that because it would be so interesting. It would be. <laughs> that is when the about when the jawless vertebrates diverged from the jawed vertebrates. So we have vertebrates that have jaws and that don't have jaws. And there are not many jawless vertebrates around. There's still some around today. Remember, there are 60,000 jawed vertebrates, about 100 jawless. And these are lampreys and hagfish. (laughs) Now, I don't remember what hagfish look like, but lampreys are kind of, they look like a, um, a leech, a big leech. Right. Yeah. yeah. And okay. they have a they have a mouth that has a whole bunch of little teeth. It's like a round mouth with a whole bunch of little teeth, and they grab onto the side of something and just. Hagfish e- are like eel like things out. They're long yeah. things. So they're the same then. And, they, and you might have seen the hagfish. They have this ability to produce a huge amount of slime. Yeah. And I don't oh, know that's under right. what conditions if it's their you know a defensive. But I if you look is. up images, you can see. Pe- I mean, you can huge amounts of slime. They're both of these animals are just they're very bizarre looking. And are there? You think there are only two? Do you think maybe there's others we haven't found uh, in the depths of the be. ocean? No, could be maybe. I mean, one should assume we haven't found everything out there, right? Yeah, right. I mean, we didn't even know there were bacteria in the ocean up until (laughs) 20 (laughs) years ago, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Look at all that slime. Oh, that's crazy. (laughs) Oh, yeah, yeah. And these guys, these are the funny thing. We were saying this before we started. Um, I showed my son pictures of these, uh, and and he commented that he thought it looked like the worm from Dune. So Mm -hmm. if you know those sandworms with those big mouths that are round and they kind of, you know, have all the teeth, that's what these things look like. But you should definitely Google what they look like because they're very interesting. So these are jawless vertebrates, and some time ago people started studying them to figure out, you know, comparative studies, how they're different. And um, 
they were found to mount immune responses. Lampreys in particular uh, could, for example, they would reject a graft. You could inject them with viruses and bacteria. They would mount an immune response. But as soon as we started sequencing their genomes, we found they didn't have T cell receptors, B cell receptors, or even MHC. That's right. So what is going on here? So people started looking for uh, genes of the lamprey whose expression is upregulated in lymphocytes that were stimulated with an antigen of some kind. And uh, they found a lot of sequences, including what turned out to be many leucine-rich repeat modules. So these are stretches of leucines repeated over and over again, and there, were, and there were many different ones. Each module was very different, and the number of modules was different, but they always flanked with some invariant sequences. And this is very reminiscent of what a toll-like receptor looks like in our yeah. system. So when I was right. talking to Cooper, he's telling me this, and I said, oh my gosh, it's a toll-like receptor, because if That's you look right. at the pictures of toll-like receptors, it's leucine-rich they repeats. Just like they yeah. form these but, beta strands, and they oh, make yeah, a yeah. mountain nice Cool thing, right? And they had the, the the conserved caps on either end. Yep. But those are static, right? TLRs yeah, right. are encoded in the genome. Yep. And the sequences of them do not change with the exception of small polymorphisms. Right. So this, there's something different about these. Yeah. Things. So these are lots of variable modules, flanking yeah. sequences and variant. And all the these modules, all these LRR, leucine rich repeats, seem to have derived from a single gene lacking most of the coding region for it. So although nearby, so so if you if you cloned a cDNA from an mRNA, that um, leucine rich repeat uh, was came from a single gene, but there are many others in the genome as well. So somehow right. specific ones were getting into each message. So basically what was found was that in in these lymphocytes uh, of the uh, lampreys, adjacent leucine rich repeat modules are incorporated by recombination, which generates the diversity. And so people started thinking, well, maybe this is an antigen receptor. One lymphocyte makes one assembled variable lymphocyte receptor gene, is what it was called, VLR. It could almost be VRR, except L. <laughs> <laughs> variable lymphocyte receptor gene. So they're clonally produced by a single uh, lymphocyte. And eventually they showed that these molecules are the antigen receptors. They will bind antigens. Right. And when you say clonally, we're talking about each individual lymphocyte expresses one and only one of these. Right. So they each have an independent specificity. And we've when you put a whole group of them together, together they can recognize a lot of different things, but each one recognizes one thing. And that's that's how our immune system works with T cells and B cells. And both lampreys and hagfish eventually were shown to have these. They have multiple. You, you, I think in the paper you'll see they work with VLRB, but there's also VLRA and C. So these are membrane-bound proteins, the variable lymphocyte receptors. They have an N-terminal cap, and they have multiple leucine-rich repeat modules. There's a connecting peptide and then a cap at the C-terminus, and then a stalk that connects it to the cell. So they're present on the surface of what are called T-like lymphocytes. And these develop, it's really cool if you if you look this up, they re, in what looks like a thymus, but it's at the tip <laughs> of the gill filaments in the fish. It's crazy. <laughs> it's amazing, <laughs> crazy stuff, right? So these proteins are eventually secreted, of course, right? And they have a curved structure that looks very much like a toe-like receptor. If you just look up toll-like receptor and look at the pictures, you'll see it's a curved structure with lots of leucine-rich repeats. And these VLRs look very similar. And a number of structures of uh, VLRs bound to antigens have been solved by structural methods. And you can see that the antigens bind uh, in the curved or the, the concave part of the, uh, the molecule. And which is different from where it would bind, like, for instance, on an globulin, because their complementary determining region loops, they bind flatter. They're, it's not a concave structure. So right. I think that'll be interesting when we talk into the paper about the similarities between what they bind, but yet they have this different structure. So cell-like receptors can bind nucleic acids or proteins. Cindy, yep. Cindy 
in that case, does the ligand also bind in the concave region? So it's really interesting because HTLR seems to bind its ligand in a different way. So typically, two of these TLRs come together. And if you think of them as Cs, so these curved solenoid Cs, they'll go sort of facing opposite directions and come touch each other. So the two opposite, uh, opposite facing Cs. Some of the ligands bind at the top where the two come together. Some bind um, on the side. Some bind where the two come together, um, like on the face where they touch each other, the two TLRs. And some bind in the concave um, mm. part of it, mm. but it, mm. they, it's not like you just have a, like the, if you, if you take the palm of your hand and you form a C, it's not like every ligand just sticks there in the palm. So they all bind in very different ways. There's a, um, I'd have to look it up, to, but there's a cell paper review article that shows really nicely all the different ways that they can bind, but it's not, it's not like a one size fits all for them. It's, it's, it's unusual how these TLRs mm. work and mm. why there's so many different things. And th the other thing is that some of the TLRs can bind more than one ligand and they bind them differently. So there isn't a conserved way that a TLR binds a ligand. So is it thought that the TLRs evolved from these VLRBs or VLRs or were the TLR like molecules first and then adapt these, these others evolved from them? So I think, I think it's it's an example of using the same idea in different ways. So a mm. convergent evolution, more than one way to solve a problem. Just because, um, so leucine rich repeat are, are, is not a structural component that's unique to a TLR or a VLR. It's mm. present in some other proteins. Mm -hmm. And so somehow that structure um, cassette was useful to solve both this problem to bind antigen like things in the VLRs and to bind structural microbial components in the TLRs. And so it's it's weird. So it's the VLRs are sort of like a T or a B cell receptor and sort of like a TLR. Mm -hmm. So like a B or T cell receptor in the fact that they use this cassette method and they recombine to make a functional gene and like a T and B cell receptor where they bind, you know, the ligand in, in, in one general similar way. But like a T cell, like uh, similar to a TLR, they are using these cassettes in a way to recognize microbial structures as well. Right. So I, I don't think that it's a case of one derived from the other, but I'm not sure what people have done way back looking at, you know, where are these separated 550 million years ago to, to ask whether one came from the other. But I think that it's just that the cassette was used in both and then used differently. You know, I think there's an example also in, um, what are those little spiky animals that are in the water um, that are like around, uh, what are they called? Sea urchins. Sea urchins. So I think sea urchins have like hundreds and hundreds of TLRs, and that's their only innate mechanism. Oh, wow. Hmm. So that's another way to solve the problem, to duplicate a functional full-length TLR many, many, many times in the genome to get more Mm. Um, the ability of, to recognize more than one thing. Right. So I guess, there's, you know, there's different ways to solve that same yeah. need to recognize many, many different things with a limited repertoire of receptors. Now, these VLRs are multivalent. Uh, yes. There, there are four or five identical chains linked at one end, you can almost think of an IgM molecule, right? A multimeric mm -hmm. IgM, yeah. where the the um, antigen binding regions are at the outside, and then uh, the inside they have these stalk regions. They're actually linked by disulfide bonds. So this gives you like eight or ten antigen binding sites. So you have lots, right. of, you have pretty high avidity. Remember, in, in immunoglobulins you have a heavy and light chain, and that's two heavies and two light chains with three CDRs complementarity determining regions that give you the antigen binding site. So I guess and two of them, one on them. each end. Right. Yep. right. Now, IgM has five times two would be 10, right? They're five IgM, right. pentameric IgM, right? Which you make early right. on, you know, in, in, in an immune response. The idea is you haven't yet matured the antibody by... Um, maturation in the in the lymph nodes so you make this multivalent IgM so you get a little better avidity before you do cyper, somatic hypermutation. 
Right. And we, when we talk about avidity, we're talking about not changing the affinity, which is the mm-hmm. strength with which the binding region binds to the antigen. But the fact that you can bind more than one of those increases the, it's not, it's, it's avidity, but it increases the strength of the interaction. I get, I don't know, what, what would we use as an example for that? As if you were able to to grab onto something in two places versus one place, you'd have a stronger grip, even though your grip in each hand isn't necessarily different. Yeah, yeah. Right. Hmm. A little bit on how these molecules are made uh, as the lymphocytes develop. The There is a VLR gene, and a sequence in the middle of it is replaced with these LRR sequences, and that gives you the diversity. So you have a whole bunch of LRRs that are put in to form a single VLR. Now, if it were an antibody or an immunoglobulin, it would be done by recombination activating gene, right? But there's mm-hmm. no RAG in these individuals. right? So rather, it is done by a process called gene conversion, where mm-hmm. the LRR cassettes are copied into the final gene from where they reside in the genome. And this is an interesting process that needs an enzyme called an activation-induced cytosine deaminase, AID, yep. which plays a role in somatic hypermutation of antibodies in the jawed vertebrates. But there's no somatic hypermutation here. It's really interesting. There's an AID involved, but it's needed for gene conversion, not somatic hypermutation. But it doesn't matter because all of the LRRs in the genome of these lampreys can give rise to combinatorial diversity of over 10 to the 14th specificities. <laughs> you could have that Quite many good. different antigens recognized by these VLRs. It's really amazing, right? It is. <laughs> it is. So they don't need somatic hypermutation. So that's the whole thing in summary. You have jawed and jawless vertebrates. They have very different receptors to recognize antigens. You know, the details are different, the way... And immunoglobulins versus VLRs uh, are are made and how they diversify. But in the end, it's kind of a similar thing, right? You yep. have, no, as Cindy said, there's no one gene in the germline. It has to be put together, and it just happens to be two different kinds of proteins that are assembled to do this. Really amazing. It's a cool. Uh, so studying, you know, old th- things like these uh, lampreys can be really illuminating. Um, one last comment. Um, if you look at the sequences of these jawed and jawless vertebrates, a common ancestor seemed to have had both VLR-like and T-cell receptor, B-cell receptor-like molecules. Okay, so they seem to be both present in ancestors. And yep. one went to the jawed vertebrate lineage, and that became Im- antibodies, immunoglobulins, and RAG was needed for that, and then the other became the, uh, the jawless vertebrates. It's pretty cool. Right. Yeah. The last thing that I thought was cool when um, when I was talking with Max about this, um, the idea of these VLRs come in two flavors, and you sort of mentioned that the VLR A and the VLR B, mm. and one of them looks more like a T cell receptor and that it's surface bound exclusively and has some m- mechanism to recognize whatever it's recognizing by maybe a phagocytic like cell, but then the other one acts more like a B cell receptor where Mm. it can be surface bound or secreted. So it looks more like an antibody. So I just thought that was really fascinating that it also developed this idea that you can have the surface bound or the secreted versions of these and it's clonal to each depending on which VLR gene it expresses. So I thought that was really interesting too. Yep. Cool. All right. So, so this is all meant for as background for a paper, which I came across a while ago. It was actually suggested to us on TWIV by one of the authors, John Udell, and it's it's published in eLife. It's called Lamprey VLRB Response to Influenza Virus Supports Universal Rules of Immunogenicity and Antigenicity. And these are from two groups at the NIAID of NIH and Emory University, uh, Altman, Benick, Udell, and Heron. And in this paper, they basically want to know if we immunize lampreys with a well-known antigen, i.e. influenza virus, do we get the same kinds of responses? Do we direct it against the same parts of the proteins, and do they have similar functions? Um, So what they do here 
is they get lamprey larvae, and I have a picture that we'll put in the show notes of a person's a palm with tiny cute. lamprey larvae, okay? They're not going to bite you yet because they don't have that big grinding thing <laughs> at one end. <laughs> uh, but these are purchased from commercial fishermen, and they bought them. They're just outbred lampreys, <laughs> and they they immunize them with influenza virus, and then they collect the blood of these um, lampreys to characterize the, the VLRs. Now, did they inject them or did they incubate them in the water? Because for some fish immunizations, you can actually just put the infectious agent or whatever mm. into the water and it can immunize them. I think they injected them, if I remember correctly. All right. They injected them, in fact, three times. And I wonder, I mean, we know that in our species and other species around us, that the the route of immunization does matter in mm. determining immunodominance. So maybe if it was in the water, it would be Different. more of this mucosal base response instead of yeah. what they're looking for is systemic in the blood. Well, so I just found blood, that but. they immunized them three times by intrasalemic cavity injections. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. All right. So they, they use a H1N1 influenza virus that, type of, uh, the subtype of influenza based on the surface glycoproteins. And this is a, a 1934 isolate called PR8, Puerto Rico 8, and it's commonly used in the laboratory. They inject this into the lampreys, and then they can simply run out <laughs> the protein on a challenge. You can see the, <laughs> the increase in the VLRB, which they said goes up sevenfold mm -hmm. in the serum, which is amazing, right? Because- yep. If you did this in a mouse, it wouldn't go up. Yeah, Cindy, what do you think about that? I, I was, I was taught that you know our response to things is not really different between species, meaning like the dose response uh, normalized to how big the animal is. We can't. I mean, there's not this huge influx of immunoglobulins after um, activation. So it seems mm. like the lamprey have have an ability to increase it way more than humans or mice. Yeah, I think, I mean, we get we get elevations in specific antibody responses, right. like, right? Because we typically measure that by putting the antigen of interest on the plate by and then measuring by ELISA whether the antigen-specific immunoglobulin goes up. But if you, remember, if you measure total IgG, it depends, but, you know, it often will not vary that much. Um, I think... If I remember, some the, the IgA in the gut can go up, mm -hmm. but I'm not 100% sure about that. But yeah, so I, I think that usually we're measuring specific antibody responses, but this is more, you know, this is just total, a total yeah. response. Yeah. And so it almost reminds me more of what happens in insects, you know, with um, the production of antimicrobial peptides in response to uh, infection. Hmm. Interesting. So then they say what... Influenza virus proteins are these VLRBs directed against. So they take purified proteins from virus particles and they mix them and use an ELISA format. So first they show that these bind these VLRBs bind intact virus and not a different virus, a parainfluenza virus, which is of a different family. And then they say if we take the individual proteins of influenza virus which ones are being bound by these VLRBs. And it it's over 90% is against the surface glycoproteins of the virus, the hemagglutinin and the neuraminidase, the HA uh, and the NA. And they can also look at um, virus themselves. They can make reassortants. They could swap out the genes for the surface glycoproteins for a different virus entirely, an H3N2, and show that they don't react uh, with that as well. So most of the antibodies are specific for HA and NA. And that, you would see the same thing in mice if you did this experiment in mice. So right away, it's telling you that something is very similar. Here we have this lamprey and a mouse, yet they both seem to be reacting with the same proteins right. uh, of influenza. The immunodominant proteins, the HA and the, and the NA, are both immunodominant in lampreys as well. And then they take a different influenza virus, H3N2, because who knows, maybe H1N1 is weird. Put in H3N2, you get the same immunodominance. HA is immunodominant. So, um, so far, 
it looks like mice and lampreys are giving us the same message. So do we make antibodies against <clears throat> the HA and the NA? What are these antibodies doing? Because we know in mice, if you immunize them with influenza virus, the antibodies can have an effect on the virus. The antibodies, of course, could block infection, and they can also block the binding of virus to red blood cells. And that's a mm -hmm. common assay for influenza virus, the so-called hemagglutination assay. Mm -hmm. If you mix influenza virus with red blood cells, they will bind the red blood cells and, and cause a lattice to form in a, in, a, in a well, in a plastic well. So if you just put red blood cells in a plastic well, after about 30 minutes, they tumble to the bottom. They find a nice little, form a nice little button. And if you had virus present, they would make a nice little lattice. And I, I used to do many, many of these as a PhD <laughs> student many, many years ago. And I remember this with great fondness. We used to have, we used to do this in 96 well plates, and we would have these diluters. So you'd put the virus in the first well, and then we had these sticks that would go into each well, and they had a little head on them, and you would grab them between your two palms and rotate them to mix them. Then you'd pick them all up at once and transfer them to the next set of, what, 12 wells, mm. mix them again. You'd go all the way down the whole 96 well plate. It was so cool. To be able to do that, you know, with skill is very satisfying. Well, anyway, <laughs> <laughs> so what you can then do, if influenza virus causes hemagglutination, you can ask, can an antibody prevent that? Because an antibody directed against the HA may do that, right? Right. So that's called yeah. hemagglutination inhibition. So if you have hemagglutination, you have a lattice of red blood cells. If you now had an antibody along with the virus and the red blood cells, you will prevent the formation of a lattice, so you'll have the formation of a button. Right. And in fact, they show that these lamprey VLRBs can inhibit hemagglutination using their H1N1 virus, but not against other H3N2 or influenza B viruses. So mouse and lamprey VLRBs will have HI hemagglutination inhibition activity. They will also inhibit viral infectivity you can infect cells with virus, right? The influenza virus will infect. If you add antibodies, you will block infection. You can measure infection in a variety of ways. You could do a plaque assay. You could do hemagglutination assay. The antibodies to the mouse, the mouse antibodies and the lamprey VLRB both can block infection. So, so far, they're very similar in yep. their biological effects. Right. They're both there, which is the ELISA, and then they're both functional. Yeah which is this test. So HA is a big target for antibodies, obviously. It's got a globular oh, yeah. head, it's got a fibrous stem, and then it's embedded in the membrane of the virus. And people over the years have studied this, this HA extensively as to what sequences give rise to antibodies. Now, there are lots of antibodies that are directed against epitopes on the head of the hemagglutinin as well as on the stalk. And so what they do here is they use a nice little genetic trick, they have a panel of H1N1 viruses with amino acid substitutions uh, on the five defined antigenic sites on the head of the HA. And they simply ask, do these substitutions disrupt the binding of the lamprey antibodies? That's cool, right? That's a oh, yeah. clever way to do it. And they find that, in fact, um, they see a, a significant loss of binding with six of these substitutions and 60% loss with 12 substitutions. So in other words, the lamprey antibodies seem to be binding the same antigenic sites on the head of the HA as uh, mouse antibodies. I thought that was crazy. Yeah, yeah. Isn't that I mean, that's amazing. So basically <laughs> an antigenic site is an antigenic site. What? 550 million years separate them. They <laughs> recognize the exact epitope on the surface of the the. And I guess, well, I don't know, but the question would be, do lampreys ever get infected with influenza virus? Or did they, you know, ancient, in ancient Right, history? would they have ever seen it? Maybe not, right? But did, if not, it would just say that it doesn't matter because any antigen you throw at this lamprey can, it can make VLRs to, uh, to bind it, right? Yep. <laughs> it's very cool. Um, so they did some competition assays that basically... Um, confirm these findings as well. They compete lamprey plasma against mouse, and they can, again, show that uh, the, the, the antibodies and the VLRBs are binding to same antigenic site. 
Um, and they, they use monoclonals in this case because we have mouse monoclonal antibodies against each antigenic site on the tip of the HA. And they use whole, pla- whole uh, plasma from uh, lampreys. And they can see that some compete and some do not compete. So the, when you start to break down the antigenic site specificity, you know, it's a little bit different, but that's not surprising because even mice, no. even mice and humans uh, are different in that respect as well. Right. Uh, they, isn't, so isn't, isn't the tip of the HA though, it, it seems to be that's the dominant it is. antigen. So that's what's driving the majority of the immune response. But what we're, what we understand though, is that that's the most highly variable part. Correct. Right. So, so if there, what people are trying to do is get more, more strong responses against the stalk region, which is less variable, right? Mm-hmm. That's right. The stem yeah. is is immunosubdominant, and they're. But if you can make an antibody against the stalk, it's broadly neutralizing. It neutralizes right. many many different HA types because they're all conserved. The sequences are conserved, and so yeah, that's what people are trying to do: is somehow stimulate the production of these stem antibodies. And they do find here they. Um, they have one plasma um, that didn't block binding of an antibody against the stem. And so they say, just like in mammals, the stem is poorly immunogenic in lampreys. And so the lamprey response is focused, just like the mouse response, on the globular domain right. uh, of the HA. And it, I wonder if they thought, after they got these results, maybe if we're looking into changing the way that we generate antibodies to something that's not this, um, to the stalk, maybe if the lampreys were generating it to the stalk, it would be interesting to try to subvert that in some way to find out why that is. And, but in fact, it's the same. So it's the peptidic nature of these proteins that's driving the antibody generation and, and the immunodominance yeah, of the yeah. antibodies. So, so in, in mice, what you can do is the, you can do the following experiment. If you infect the mouse with, say, H1N1 influenza virus, okay, and then you go back and boost, you get mostly antibodies against the head. But if you, instead of boosting with the same virus, if you use a different virus where you have the same stem, HA stem, but with a different head, Mm-hmm. You now get a primary response against the head. You don't get a memory response. Mm-hmm. And you get a better response against the stem. Right. Because now the, the animal has seen the stem twice with a different head. And apparently, if you put a different head, it it reduces its immunodominance somehow. Hmm. So is that an argument for why we should get our yearly flu vaccine? Because <laughs> you'll keep boosting against uh, d- different heads but the stock will remain primarily the same, and so you can over time generate more specific antibodies against that, or no? Well, if you do that, um, the head. Well, I don't. It's a good question, but I think the heads are, are too similar. If you if you do mm, okay. year after year, it's really the same type subtype, and it's too similar. You have to have a totally different HA. So you'd have to have an H right. one and an H four or an H seven or something mm-hmm. that humans have never seen. So that's mm-hmm. the Palazzi approach to it. They're trying that in people. And we'll see if that works. Um, and the idea would be that you only need to do that every, I don't know, 10 or 15 years, depending on how long the memory lasts. We don't mm-hmm. really know how long it would last, right? But they could do that here in, in lampreys. If they wanted to push this, they could then say, well, does can we make a, a stem response by swapping heads? But, of course, we don't need to make lampreys immune to Hmm. influenza viruses so might as well do but the they are they are a small model and if their concepts translate would be interesting yeah it would be useful yeah. yep and that's related i think my favorite line of the paper was the last one where they <laughs> yeah. said perhaps when it comes to antibody responses neither mice nor lamprey lie after all because a common thing we say is monkeys exaggerate and mice lie in the terms of the translatability of of the science but i think what this paper argues and shows is that these like cindy said i mean we need small animal models and we can learn a lot from them so um yeah it was interesting. Yeah, I like that line. It's good. Yeah, that's good. We say that a lot on Twiv. <laughs> Mice lie and monkeys exaggerate. I wonder if that's where they heard it. Because I know mm. that I know that John Udell listens to Twiv. I, by the way, the lampreys were purchased from a company called Lamprey Services. 
<laughs> in Michigan, <laughs> uh, where I understand that these are an invasive species. So I guess yeah. they have mm -hmm. people catching them to try and, although I doubt that's going to make much of a difference. I don't know what they do with them when they catch them. I know we have gobies that they're they're small fish that have invaded our lake here in Cougar Lake, and if you fish and you catch one, you're supposed to kill it and not put it back. Oh wow! But it doesn't really make much difference because there's so many of them. Many, yeah. yeah. I think uh, it's just if you study them. Yeah, Lamprey Services is in Ludington, Mi Mi Michigan. We have all the necessary permits for collecting and export. <laughs> We can guarantee that the species collected is the sea lamprey and that the animals are in good health. The shipment consists of a 48-quart cooler. Wow. Fish are in plastic bags containing pure oxygen. They will stay alive for 40 hours. So if you want to work on sea lampreys, that's the page. <laughs> that's the company. <laughs> <laughs> I guess you could keep them as a pet. I mean, if you were into, into that. Are you going to do that, uh, Steph? You're going to I mean, no. I, no? The, I don't know dog, about that. But isn't dog, there a no. problem with people keeping those? What are the Asian fish that people keep and then they they let them go when they get too big and then they have invasive? Oh, yeah, right. 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 That yeah. happens often. So alligators in some places, right? You go, yeah. you buy a pet one. Or, um, so maybe it's not a great idea. Well, you know, that, that's what has spread the, the frog fungus around the world. People buying yes. frogs and moving yeah. them around and they have a fungus. They introduce it to a new area where the frogs don't have the fungus and boom. Yep. We, we really wreck things, don't we? All right. <laughs> Let's do some email. All right. Um, Cindy, can you take that first one? I will try. So <laughs> C Stephen writes, B cells or T cells in TB, a continuing conundrum, the Lancet Respiratory Medicine. Hail to the geniuses who make head or tail of immunology. Here is a Lancet paper I can't even begin to unpick, so I thought perhaps it might be a good one to help illustrate some principles. I'd be particularly interested to know if my BCG scar was all for nothing, as it appears that people can still infected with TB even after having gone through this scabby procedure as a child. Keep it up. Steve Hawkins, Lutton, Bedf mm. Bedfordshire, England. Uh, oh, oh and, and importantly, he says, gray day, but plum blossoms out at last and birds singing. <laughs> and I can't, do, I can't do that with a British accent. But um, so uh, I think what, what's interesting here that um, needs to be talked about is so BCG is Bacillus Calmet, Calmet, Calmet Guerin. Uh, I never can pronounce that. <laughs> um, but it is it is a um, less dangerous version of Mycobacterium tuberculosis. And so the thought was, just like vaccines with um, cowpox for smallpox, as uh, Edward Jenner originally did, um, the idea is that you take a less dangerous one and it pr protects you then against the more dangerous one, which is Mycobacterium tuberculosis, which... We used to say infects one third of the world, but I think it's now they're saying that's less, but it's still a major problem. But the thing with BCG is it definitely prevents more serious complications. So TB is a respiratory disease um, that causes large granulomas um, in the lung. And then if, there's, if those granulomas stay intact, the individual is okay. Basically, those are um, walling off of the mycobacterium bacterium in these granulomas. But if they start to break down, they become what's called caseous, which is cheesy in the middle. And um, if they bust open, then the, the bacteria get into the airway and the person coughs and it's extremely contagious. And so BCG will help the immune system keep that in check. So there are far fewer transmissions of TB and people get less sick from it. The The problem is, is that it doesn't fully prevent the disease. And that's true. You know, one thing that we always get sticky issues about is that vaccines don't prevent you from ever getting exposed to and infected by something, but they help you overcome it so quickly you might not never know you had it. And so in the case, and that's true for, for any vaccine, what we're doing is we're tricking the immune system into thinking it's seen it before. So it can act more rapidly and get things under control more quickly. So even with influenza, if you have the influenza vaccine and it works great, it doesn't mean you won't get sick at all, but you may not know you're sick or you might get a much less serious version of the disease. 
course. And so the same is true with BCG. So it's not all for nothing, but it doesn't fully prevent the disease. The problem with TB is that this is a long-term thing. This particular bacterium is extremely crafty and has lots of ways to subvert the immune system. And so the primary way to keep it under control is to wall it off. And actually eliminating those bacteria is extremely difficult. So even if you're on multiple drugs, the antibacterial drugs, for a long, long time and your compliance is good, these people are being treated for six, nine months or longer of daily hardcore antibiotics. And it's just simply that these bacteria live inside of macrophages, which are immune cells, and they're really good at living inside of them. So if you think about it, um, macrophages eat bacteria and they put them into these capsules, these phagosomes that are extremely hostile. They're supposed to kill these bacteria. And these bacteria love that environment. They secrete all of these things that just, they set it up as a nice home. And so they live within this really, really dangerous and, and destructive phagosome happily. So it's really, really hard to get rid of these bacteria. So once you get them, they're there for you know life unless you have a really strong hard course of antibiotics to get rid of these. And so again, coming back to this BCG treatment or, or BCG immunization will prevent you from getting really serious complications from disease. Unfortunately, it won't always protect you from ever getting infected. And so you might be TB positive. One of the really interesting things is in the US, we do not use BCG. And we, in fact, um, use a TB test where you prick um, the, the forearm. It's a TB time test to test for TB. And if you've been immunized with BCG, you will test positive on that. And so that's why we don't use it in the U.S. because then you can tell who has TB. And so the problem that we've had in the lab is when people come from other countries and they've been immunized with BCG, they get a TB test. They test positive, and of course, everybody freaks out. Oh, no, now you have to have um, lung um, radiographs and everything else to see if you're actually infected with TB because then they have to worry about what you're working with in the lab and so forth. And often, they're not really infected, but they have been immunized with BCG and they test positive. So so there's some interesting biology around all of this. This um, this one, the paper you sent is about a new kind of vaccine. Yes. And it's a, actually a few, four different proteins, with an adjuvant, right? Yep. And they make the statement that there are other vaccines. Is it just another vaccine candidate or is it novel? <laughs> there are a lot there so there are a lot of vaccine candidates being tried and I don't I don't know the various levels of success of all of them. Um, usually they're they're using drugs to treat it because trying to get the immune system to overcome it is challenging. Mm. So all the vaccines may very well work, but it's getting that um, getting those immune cells into that granuloma and being able to fight the bacterial infection within the macrophage, mm. um, how effective that will be is, is I don't, uh, unclear if they have to be tested. Yeah. So, Yeah, this is only a phase one, so we only That's know right. uh, safety and they have a little bit of antibody and T cell information, but really you have to do a, a challenge, not a challenge, but you have to send people out into the world and see if they get yep. TB or not, right? Right. And we, of which there's plenty, so that can be done. There are. And places where TB in the U.S., I mean, we don't think about it in the U.S. much, but where it can be a problem where people congregate that are also in high-stress situations. So mm. you can yeah. think of hospitals, you know, you, uh, you can think of healthcare facilities like for the elderly, but also, you know, places at the border where people are in high stress and are detained. Um, and so there are definitely some infectious disease implications to how we, how, again, you know, when politics is relevant and infectious disease, they definitely, they intersect. Mm. Right. And so when you have people in those high stress environments, that's when your immune system becomes compromised. And if, if that happens and that breaks down, that's when TB can get the upper hand and spread. Right. All right. Uh, Steph, can you take Anthony's email? Sure. Anthony writes, I heard you mention this on the recent immune, you seem to indicate that this was an ongoing issue. So I'm just going to preface this by saying, I think this was a while back, but we were talking about, you know, using animals and that pigs as well as mice can savage their young, which, you know, evolutionarily, maybe it's an adaptation if there were predators around mm -hmm. or if there was a runt that was sick that could, you know, resources, you're trying to redistribute them. And so I think that's what Anthony is mentioning. 
And I had mentioned that our mothers keep eating their offspring, our mice, (laughs) and we can't get our experiments done. (laughs) Right. It's it's really unfortunate. It's not a fun thing to come upon when you're going in for the day to do chores or whatever. So uh, Anthony says, I raised mice for the pet trade some years back and never encountered this problem. He, I first looked at enriching the diet and environment, put the cardboard centers from rolls of toilet paper or sections from paper towels in the cages. This gives the mice tunnels to explore, particularly for the moms, give them handfuls of paper strips from a shredder to build nests. In addition to mouse chow, he says, sections of celery, carrots, chickpeas, whole corn, um, sunflower seeds, peanuts, apples, whole wheat bread, possibly with peanut butter, and many other items for human consumption can be used. These don't have to be given all at once, just a couple each day. If a conference room generates leftover sandwiches, salads, mm-hmm. bagels, these can be collected and used. Hey, graduate students are the ones that yeah, they get to those leftovers, they get those. not the mice. <laughs> I'll put my foot down. Um, don't use avocado or chocolate, so obviously mice have some maybe allergic reactions. Mung bean sprouts are particularly valuable, but these need to be grown on site. The light famished stuff in stores is expensive, nutritionally bereft, and often microbe infested. Well, I guess all things are, but (laughs) covering the sides of the enclosures that house the pregnant mice with paper can be tried. I've never had to do this myself, but my mouse handling was all kept low. Labs often have mice on high shelves. Mice are not squirrels. Elevation (laughs) is certain distressed mice. (laughs) You know, that's a good point. It is a good point. We do have our cages at all levels, right? Depending on where they are. And, you know, so often, often we good. also screw them up because they're nocturnal and we exactly. put the lights on during the day so people can go in and see, right? Right, right. So, and, you know, I I appreciate all of these suggestions, but you, I think, Vincent, you had mentioned everything that goes in has to be sterile and really yeah, has sure. to be very controlled. So a lot of these suggestions are good. Um, but, you know, some of these can be applicable, like you said, considering the height levels. So if I put some carrots in the mouse cage, I would be banned from the mouse facility <laughs> because everything that goes in has right. to be sterile in the cage because uh, otherwise you get uh, things, you get infections that you don't want. Now we, uh, the solution seems to have been, we would have all, we would have litters and then Amy would go in the next day and they'd be all gone, right? Mm. Mm-hmm. She, They told her, you do the husbandry, you take care of the mice, which means you know, changing the cages and so forth. And that makes a difference because I think the people doing the handling, you know, they, they'll take the lid off, throw the mice into another cage, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't think they are, cool. that's stressful. And I, you know, Amy is very careful and slow, you know, take one out at a time by the tail. And it seems to make a difference. We now have some litters. So hopefully they'll they'll stay, right? Sometimes what you can do too is if you're good at knowing when the mice are very pregnant, I guess you're pregnant or not pregnant. But when they're <laughs> when they're close to deliver, yeah. you can put a do not change the cage sign on. And so yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, a yeah. little stinky in there, but if you leave the mom for the first couple of days, she calms down a little bit and then it usually doesn't happen. But I did I wanna also respond to Anthony. Do we do um the, the mice are quite enriched. Uh, at, at our facility, we do give them, it's not toilet paper rolls, but it's the same idea, these little cage, that, you know, these little cardboard things for them to chew on and mm. walk under and snuggle in, and so to tunnel under. And there's we, we definitely give them shreddable bedding that they shred up and they make their little home there. So they, they do get all of that kind of enrichment um, in their cages, and we try not to house them by themselves because that's also quite stressful. Mm. So if you can get a mating pair and, and, and leave them together, often they will they will leave the litter as well. Some people don't like to leave the male in there. It can be bad. But if you leave them together, often they'll they'll mm-hmm. continue to, to mate and have more litters over time. And how we f- uh, figured out uh, the uh, my pig situation is something that I'm not reinventing any wheel here. It's widely used in the swine industry, but it's something called farin crates. And and so if you've seen animals in crates on swine farms, um, I can attest to it's very functional for a functional purpose. And we put them in at least at what we do is two days what the anticipated fairing or giving birth. And then we keep them in there until we can be sure that she's not going to be aggressive or roll on them. And so they are immobilized. They can stand up and sit down, but they cannot turn around, try, you know, to try to get the baby. So that's, that's the way that both science and the industry has solved that problem. Mm, Cool. 
All right. Thank- they will. The big pigs will turn around and accidentally roll on their. Yeah, big, they're so. They're cute. really big. They're. They so, don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's not their yeah. fault. Especially in a small space like a lab place, right? Whereas maybe in nature it wouldn't happen so frequently. I mean, that could be true. Although we do get our pigs do have quite big, big rooms that yeah. they're in. So they do have a lot of space. I think it's just right after, you know, they're usually when, when they have like 16 to 20 piglets, they're usually giving birth over a course of time. Mm. They're standing up, they're going down. So they may be a little disoriented and focus on the birthing and not the, the there's wow. half of the piglets are suckling her and then she's still giving birth. It's a whole, wow. it's tough. whole thing. My gosh. Yeah. I have a newfound respect for pigs. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Melanie writes, hello to the immune group. I have been enjoying your podcast for a while, Vincent. I'm delighted to listen to your immune series, whereby you have done a great job to explain the basics as well as keep us up to date in a complicated area. I like the format so far. I was looking for an immune mug or shirt to buy, but I couldn't find any. Please direct me in the right direction if there are any available to purchase or let me know if I need to wait a bit longer. Thank you for making my long commute to work much more enjoyable. I'm at Acadia University in Wolfville, Nova Scotia. Can't wait for the next immune. I was just in Nova Scotia, except I was in Halifax. Very nice. I So this morning I made some some swag, is that how you say it, for <laughs> Ooh, you, Melanie? Cool. I made some mugs and cups and a few t-shirts a white one and a dark one you go to cafepress.com slash twiv cafe press all one word dot com slash twiv and you will see there's a whole lot of stuff from all our shows but you will see immune mugs the metal things for your water and a few other things and if there's something oh, you, you, if there's yay, something too. Cool. if there's something you don't see that you want just tell me i can add i didn't add everything that's there for the other podcasts there's a lot more. All right, I have to order something. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you oh, for uh, for reminding me, Melanie. I had forgotten about that. All right, let's uh, work through the last couple ones here. Uh, Cindy, you're next with Brandon. Okay. Brandon writes, hello, Cindy, Steph, and Vincent. My name is Brandon, and I am a un- an undergraduate at the University of Alaska Anchorage, working on graduating by next spring. I do research under a professor in the field of immunology and virology, which has led me to be fascinated in immunotherapy for diseases, specifically cancer. I am writing to you to request you do a podcast on the recent cancer vaccine paper. And vaccine is in semi-quotes. I thought your podcast on CAR-T therapy was incredibly informative and well-produced, and I would find and I would find it would be incredible if you guys presented this paper on the podcast. I have included a copy of the paper attached in this email. I love the great content you produced. Thanks. Um, So this is a paper um, called Eradication of Spontaneous Malignancy by Local Immunotherapy. And I did look this up briefly. And um, what they're doing and what I like is they're using a TLR9 ligand, which is DNA, to um, inject directly into the tumor in different situations to induce um, an immune response. So it's local um, immunotherapy. And so I, I think it would be great. They're using this other ligand called o- OX40. So it's it's um, an anti-OX40 antibody plus the CPG DNA. And they seem to see really strong um, immunity against the tumor and elimination of the tumor. So it's it's intent, potentially a very exciting new therapy. So um, yeah, we could definitely think about um, talking about this more um, on a future podcast. Okay. Yeah, because our next um, writer, Bob, sent the same paper in. They, yeah, so yeah, two people sent the same paper, so clearly people are interested yeah, in this. So at some point we'll we'll do it. Um, and I guess Bob. So if you want to do the same vein there, I can do that. So so Bob wrote in about the same paper, and he said, "What does the panel make of this?" And he sent this. He mm-hmm. actually sent a link of a news article about this particular paper, mm-hmm. and he quoted um, something from the paper. It said, "Levy." So this uh, senior author on this paper is Ronald Le- Le- Levy or Levy. Do you know how you say his name? I think it's Levy. I think it's Levy. So Levy's method works to reactivate the cancer-specific T-cells by injecting microgram amounts of two agents 
directly into the tumor site. And so it's a, a microgram is one millionth of a gram. One, a short stretch of DNA called a CPG oligonucleotide works with other nearby immune cells to amplify the expression of an activating receptor called OX40 on the surface of the T cells. So CPG DNA is a TLR9 ligand. Um, the other, an antibody that binds to that OX40 activates the T cells to lead the charge against the cancer cells because the two agents are injected directly into the tumor. Only the T cells that have infiltrated it, meaning the tumor, are activated. So in effect, these T cells are pre-screened by the body to recognize cancer-specific proteins. So this really is this idea of taking and mixing these two things together, one that's stimulating the expression of this ligand on the T cells, and the other is um, an antibody targeting that um, protein on the surface of the T cell. And together, those are really mobilizing those T cells, and because they're doing it specifically inside the tumor, this is a solid tumor, they're inducing those T cells within the tumor to become anti-tumorogenic. So I guess this would be okay as long as you can inject it because not all tumors would be That's right. amenable to this, right? So if you have a liquid tumor or an unaccessible tumor, that would not be an option. If you have lots of, if you have lots of tumors like a, um, myeloma, right, that you couldn't right. inject so each one. I don't, I mean, they did some um, experiments on metastases in this paper. Mm. And I think if you inject into the primary tumor and you generate these T cells, T cells do circulate throughout mm -hmm. the body. They can leave the tumor and come back into the tumor. Mm. And so very well, they might leave the tumor and find the metastases and attack the metastases as well. Yeah. And I think with these, with these two, this paper and these two comments, just good to remember. I had a couple of people ask me about this because it was very highly covered in the press. But the, it again, was, it was yeah, done in, yeah. in mice, and we have talked before what the limitations are with doing experiments in mice and trying to translate that to humans, and particularly with these cancer immunotherapies. So I would say go back and listen to Cindy's uh, CAR T cell episode to to get the background, and and then yeah, we could definitely do another episode because it's there's a lot of interest in it for sure. Mm. All right. <laughs> Steph, you want to take the next one? Sure. Mark writes, hi team. This is a question for you all and possibly a question for listeners of the podcast as well. I was wondering if anyone could recommend some books for people like me who are interested in human immunology, which are not textbooks, something in a casual readable format. A textbook feels more geared to be read with the guidance of a teacher and often assumes the reader has some prerequisite requisite biology study. It's a broad question, I know, but I would settle for a textbook if no one knows anything more casual. Thanks for <laughs> your time and all you do. And um, Vincent has a couple recommendations, but I mean, mostly for me, it's been textbooks. There hasn't been a lot of, I don't know, think there's as much in immunology as there has been with the pathogens, viruses, bacteria, because yeah. I, I yeah. think there's more, you know, not shock value, I don't want to say that, but there's more interest gearing and immunology, I, you know, it's, I don't know if <laughs> casually can be coined compared with that. So I, I like uh, Lauren Sompirak. He has a series of books on viruses, bacteria, and he has one called How the Immune System Works. And these are very good. Uh, the virus ones are excellent. Um, he, he has a, a knack at explaining things in a simple fashion. And so there's one for the immune system. So I would recommend that. I'll put a link uh, for that one. And Cindy, you had one too, right? I, I Yeah. So it's a book I read a number of years ago, but I thought it was really fascinating. It was called A Commotion in the Blood by Stephen S. Hall. Uh -huh. And I, I found it great because it talked about Coley. Uh, and Coley was a physician about 100 years ago who was trying to treat cancer. And actually, he was treating one of the Rockefellers mm. uh, who had a bone cancer, I think, um, with uh, tuberculosis um, extracts. Mm. And it turns out that we now know one of the active components in that was CPG DNA, which is the TLR9 ligand. And Coley Pharmaceutical was begun based on that. But it's it, it has a lot of really interesting information about the historical overview of how we've tried to harness the immune system to basically for what we call now immunotherapy. But in that time, it was the um, anecdotal observation that people who got really sick when they had cancer 
would often or would mm. sometimes recover from their cancer. And so what was it about infection and cancer? And now, now that we know a lot more and we've broken this apart, it's probably having to do with being able to break the tolerance to the tumor and the immune and, you know, overcoming the immune system, everything that we're looking with checkpoint inhibitors and activation of T cells, what we just talked about within the tumor is all geared towards that. You know, the tumor is good at shutting down the immune response. And if you can overcome that, you could eliminate the tumor. And so the idea was if you got deathly ill with something that was infectious, maybe it might stimulate the, you know, break this tolerance mm. in the, the tumor. But but it generally talks about, immuno, you know, immunotherapy. It wasn't called that when this book was written, but the historical overview of how we've harnessed the immune system. And so, yeah, I think it comes back to the idea, though, that there aren't a lot of books on there on sort of the overall general, what is the immune system and how it works. But there's more specific books on various different aspects of the immune response. Maybe you need to write it, Cindy. Uh, yeah. In all my free time. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I know if you like vaccines a lot, um, Paul Offit has several books that are very, very good on that as well, including a new one that's come out. So it just depends on your, mm. you know, the types of things you're interested in. My colleague down the hall also wrote one on microbiome called the superhuman, the human superorganism, um, by Rodney Dieter. I spelled that wrong in the show notes. But yeah, so you've got these ideas. If you're interested in microbiome, there are several books about that. If you're interested in vaccines, there's books about that. Cancer and cancer immunotherapy, there's books about that. But sort of this general, how does it work, is is not very good. There are a lot of YouTube videos that can teach you a lot. Uh, one more is from Nathan. I'm loving the immune podcast. Keep up the great work in your podcasting and tweeting. I recently found this 2017 review that touches on both immunology and viruses. What a great name, super antibodies. Plain ordinary antibodies are quite amazing. Some might even say super. I thought it would be a great topic for either a snippet or full discussion. It is 29C85F and partly cloudy in Chapel Hill. <laughs> so Nathan sent a link to a review article uh, in... Nature Reviews Immunology. It's called Passive Immunotherapy of Viral Infection. Super Antibodies Enter the Fray by Laura Walker and Dennis Burton. And this is about broadly neutralizing antibodies. And they have now been found for multiple viruses, HIV, for example, influenza virus. And we talked about it for respiratory syncytial virus not too long ago. So it's a nice summary of how these are found, you know, by cloning B cells, from people who have had these infections and identifying rare ones that are broadly neutralizing. But we have actually talked about this this concept before in the RSV episode. Mm -hmm. And really the only thing that makes them super is that they're broadly neutralizing, right? I mean, yeah, there's not there's right. anything specifically different about them structurally. No, they're just okay. broadly neutralizing. We didn't know about them until we were able to, because yep. they're so rare that you don't find them unless you can clone individual B cells. I mean, that's really the technology that enabled this, right? You pull out a oh, single yeah. B cell, and then you can clone out the uh, the mRNA encoding the antibody. Remember, the B cell is making one antibody, right? Yep. So you get that, and you say, wow, and you can make the antibody. In large amounts. Yeah. And then say, look, it's broadly neutralizing. It's amazing technology. Yeah, and, and the idea of passive immunotherapy, just to put that in perspective, mm. is that's taking, like what you just said, taking an antibody that either someone else made and you purify it or cloning it and making it synthetically mm -hmm. in a pharmaceutical company. And passive means that you are yourself not making it, but you're getting it from outside. That's right. So if you have the viral infection, you get the injection of the antibodies to treat the infection. So you have two approaches. You could give people these antibodies, or you could figure out a way to induce them, as we spoke earlier about for flu. That's a little harder. Right. Uh, Steph, I'm going to ask you a hard question. <laughs> okay, I'm ready. Would you need broadly neutralizing antibodies to treat Ebola patients? Uh, well, no, because... Currently, there's only one strain of Ebola, right? So you wouldn't, it doesn't yeah, that's mutate right. like HIV. Perfect. Great answer. You, oh, went, you got an A. Do I pass? You got oh, an ding, A. Ding, ding, ding. Nice <laughs> job. You must have you been can listening. Graduate. You must I, be yeah. listening to a podcast. I do listen to a lot of micro <laughs> TV. This is true. <laughs> no, I'm sorry to put you on the spot. I knew you would. No, it's good. You know what? It's good practice for a couple months when I have to do that. My, my, my son 
uh, uh, had a um, an interview recently where he said one of the questions was a trick question. It's kind of like what I just gave you. Said, <laughs> do, do you know this thing called ping? If you ping a website, you can there's a command you can do ping and then your website, and it will tell you if it's running basically. And mm. so the person asked him, "What um, what port does ping run on?" <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't run on any port. It's a trick question to ask something <laughs> like that, right? Same thing. Well, I'm glad I passed. <laughs> Let's do some picks of the week. Cindy, what do you have for us? So uh, there was a whole um, media frenzy about a week and a half ago, and you probably know more about this than I do because you're a polio researcher, is um, they thought that in Venezuela we were detecting a new case of polio. Um, and then... They thought maybe it was a vaccine-induced case, which I started to get panicked about because I thought that would be terrible if that actually yeah. happened. But it turns out that um, they looked into it, and in fact, it was not polio. So it was a case of um, flaccid paralysis, acute flaccid paralysis in a child, 30 mo- 34-month-old 34 child. Um, and so that is a, a strong indication of something like uh, polio. Um, And so they isolated the polio virus from stool. And then, you know, all of a sudden they said, well, that must be the reason. But it turns out that this individual did not actually have polio or wild polio or vaccine-induced polio. So this this is a way that WHO screens for polio, right? They look for kids with acute flaccid paralysis which means your leg muscles are flaccid they are paralyzed and it's enough to be able to see this and they go from village to village in many parts of the world and do this and if they see a kid with afp which can be caused by a lot of things not just by Mm -hmm. polio they then take some stool and look for polio virus and what happened here is they found polio virus in the stool and so, mm-hmm. oh my gosh, and that's when the press came in, and even I tweeted last week, case of polio in Venezuela, which is terrible because it's been declared eradicated there that's for right. many, many right. years, right? The Americas are polio-free. That's right. But they did isolate polio virus type 3 from the stool. Mm-hmm. So why do we know that this did not cause the child's disease? That's the question. That's a hard question. I wouldn't expect many people to know the answer. So they sequenced it, right? Sequenced it, and they saw that it is vaccine type 3, but type 3 can cause vaccine-associated disease. So how do we know that that virus did not cause the child's polio? And that's because it has to have a certain number of mutations in the genome uh, to be able to cause polio. And this, this isolate looked pretty much like the vaccine strain. There had been a, actually a, um, a mass immunization campaign in the area just shortly before. So type 3 and type 1 were being used. They were being given to, pe- to kids, uh, oral polio vaccine. And so this child was in an area with declining vaccine coverage. It's gone mm-hmm. down to about 60% now because there's no polio. And they say, ah, who needs the oh, vaccine, right? That's mm-hmm. scary. So the kid picked up the circulating vaccine-derived virus when they sequenced it, they saw that it was very close to the, the actual vaccine, and so it was not likely that it caused any paralysis. Now, interestingly, these viruses will circulate in the population for, for many years, these vaccine viruses. And each year, the genome changes about 1%. And so you can actually calculate how long these viruses have been circulating by sequencing the genomes of stool isolates. You can say it's been around five years, 10 years, and so forth. And as Hmm. it circulates, it picks up more and more mutations that make it likely to cause paralysis. And interestingly, that is what has caused most of the polio last year, 2017, in the world, vaccine-derived poliovirus. In fact, in Syria, there were something like 70 cases, all type 2 vaccine-derived. And that's why WHO is slowly moving away from the infectious, the OPV, the Sabin vaccine, because right. it causes polio. You got to switch to the inactivated vaccine. But unfortunately, that has to be injected. It's a lot harder. Got logistical issues. 
and uh, so forth. So that's the yeah, I should have put on here too, though, because wasn't there something that just came out um, where the Gates Foundation uh, challenged people to work on solutions to be able to keep the cold chain for new for vaccines like the um, inactivated polio vaccine so that you could distribute them worldwide? And they came up with two really cool solutions that I haven't looked into in great detail. But um, it's suggesting that maybe we can do this switch over to the safer version of the polio vaccine so there aren't any um, vaccine-associated. Well, we have to make it... Well, both vaccines have to be frozen. Both the, yeah. both, both the saver and the salk both have to be frozen. But the real thing with the salk is that it has to be injected. That's and, right. And that means you need needles and you need a person who knows how to use a needle because yes. OPV, you just feed it to the kid, and it's yeah, yeah. anybody can do that, right? You can put it on a sugar cube, right? So what the Gates has done, though, is to – there are two things that are worth mentioning. One is that they're putting money into testing microneedle patches, mm-hmm. which are little patches with very tiny needles that you put on your skin with a Band-Aid. It delivers the antigen to the skin. It's, they're really immunogenic. It's been tested with – Polio vaccine, inactivated polio vaccine, it looks really good. So that could get around that. But that's going to be a few years off as well. The other problem is we have this Sabin vaccine, which is infectious. It's really good at giving you gut immunity, mucosal immunity, and that stops outbreaks. That's why if there's an outbreak in Syria, we go in with Sabin because it stops the outbreak. IPV is not very good at that. Right. We need a new vaccine that is as immunogenic in the mucosa, in the gut mucosa, mm-hmm. but doesn't revert. And, right. and the Gates has supported some interesting research, mostly in the UK, where they have made changes in the viral genome to prevent reversion. And these are actually being tested in people. And if they are immunogenic and give rise to the right antibodies and so forth, they would be used post-eradication because you know, if you, you, we can eradicate polio one day, but let's say it comes back, right? And there's an outbreak. Yeah. What we're going to do is go in with OPV, and then we're going to seed the environment with vaccine-derived strains again. And that's not good. We need something that's not going to revert, but will be just as good at stopping outbreaks. So yep. that's the story there. I'm sorry do to you, talk so much about it. No, <laughs> no I wanted no, you to talk understand. because you know more about it, but I just thought it was a really important thing to talk about because... You know, it's, it just goes to show you that the news went crazy about this, you know, oh, there's now polio and then, oh, it's vaccine induced polio disease. And then now we find out that that's really not the case. So yeah. reserving judgment until all the information is in is sometimes wise. But vaccine induced disease itself is very common. Yeah. If you go to polioeradication.org and then you go to um, polio now, you will see... Uh, the number of cases, and um, they're all the mass, vast majority of. Uh, so, last year there were to the, at this point last year, which is June, there were five wild polio cases and six vaccine derived polio cases. So, they, they, it's happening because we use this vaccine that's prone to reversion. And it's known, and it's a problem with it that we've known from the from day one. It's why the U.S. stopped using it in 2000, because there were 10 cases of polio a year in the U.S., all caused by the vaccine. It was unacceptable. Right, right. So now, you know, it's being used extensively globally, so we do have vaccine-derived disease. We have to get away from that, and that's hard. So that's the story. Yeah, I I even tweeted that out a couple weeks ago, (laughs) because I thought, oh my gosh, this is why we can't stop vaccinating after we eradicate. How can you stop vaccinating when this thing could pop up anywhere, right? Yep. But I'm glad it's not really polio. Yeah. All right. That's good. Thank you, Cindy. <laughs> Steph, what do you have? <laughs> yeah. So I have two TWIV episodes that I'm going to cross promote here um, because they are on the um, author, this, the, I guess the co-corresponding author on the paper we just did, John Udell. And the first one I think is from 2002. It's episode 208. And the second one is more recently where he goes on with his son. Oh, Both that are was really, a great one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Both are really good. Um, I will say... If you're in biomedical science and you're in training like myself, it's not for the lighthearted. 
and I appreciate John's ability to talk about the realities of science and science education in the biomedical field mm. and how postdocs have seemingly turned in to two years to five years and people having a hard time finding jobs. There's a lot of issues. And I think he speaks very truthfully about the, the problem. So I would recommend those two twists for your listening ears. Yeah, he's a good speaker. He was very good on those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's cool. Thank you. Sure. All right. I have an article at Science Based Medicine, which is a wonderful blog, by the way, written by mostly physicians, I believe. And this one's written by Stephen Novella. It's called Is Gaming Addiction a Thing? Uh, you may know that the World Health Organization has just added a gaming dis- gaming disorder to their official list of health conditions in what they call the International Classification of Diseases. So, I saw that. Yeah. Gaming addiction. And so this article goes through it and they say, what is it? Is it really an addiction? Um, what is an addiction and how does this relate? And so really good, basically. And, and in the end, Novella says, yeah, it is uh, it is an addiction because compulsive behavior is an addiction, right? And uh, this is part of it. Um, and he ends up by saying the best part is humans to an extent are not much different than rats. We have a reward system wired into our brains. When we pull the lever and get a reward, something that gives us a pleasant shot of dopamine, we pull the lever again and again. We just need to know when to stop pulling the lever. For some people, it's easier said than done, and they may need some help taking their hand off the lever. <laughs> or the phone or the <laughs> controller. Yeah, that, that mechanism, I mean, that's really why scroll feeds, feed, you know, your timelines are, you can scroll on your phone because every time it's the anticipation of something new. And yeah, so sure. there's little shots of dopamine. You, know, you continue scrolling and you look at the clock and 25 minutes have gone by. So yeah, it's, it's definitely a thing. It is. And in fact, Novella admits to uh, being an avid video gamer. <laughs> well, yeah. I don't actually play video games, but I have other uh, addictions like podcasting. <laughs> I think the important thing I took away when I look at that, when I looked at some of the stuff about this, was that the WHO was very careful to say this is not just you know something that everybody has and they want to look at their phone. That this right. is very specific. It's it's. Um, debilitating, it's interfering with your daily life, it's ongoing long term. And I think was saying it was going to apply to less than like 2% or some yeah, some yeah. low percentage right. of all people would fall into this classification. So it's not something as much as I would love to, they should throw around with your child. <laughs> 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 you have this disorder, we have to do something about it. But uh, yeah, so it, I mean, it still doesn't take away from the fact that um, those types of things are compulsive behaviors that, and they do give you the reward and the dopamine shot that you want to go back and look at it. Yep. Yeah. All three of our kids game all the time. You know, <laughs> and my, um, I don't know if both of you know this, but there's a whole industry out there. People play games and other people watch them on the internet. Oh yeah. Right? It drives me nuts. No, my kids do this. They, they spend half Twi- their Do they go to playing. Twitch? They go, do they go to Twitch? That's where yep. you, they do some other things, but yeah, Twitch is one of them. So my son, um, my son told me yeah. the other day, there's a guy on Twitch who makes half a million dollars a month. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Because people but subscribe they, to him. They sit They sit 18 hours a day and play video games. Wow. Well, they you, have food you delivered me, to if them. If you paid me half a million a month, I'd do that, yeah. <laughs> Hell, I'd podcast 18 was, hours a was, day. Nobody yeah, would watch. <laughs> there was an article in the New Yorker about that. And these people, they have managers and they get promotion. They get promotional people who sponsor them. And uh, they end they end up very unhealthy because they're sitting in a chair for eighteen hours a day in the same spot. Right. Mm. Mm. Well, if you uh, if you guys want to make half a million a month podcasting, let me know. <laughs> you'd have to. While that would not be a bad thing, <laughs> you'd have to give up your other jobs. We'd all have to give it up, but that's amazing. Yeah, I might be okay with that. You know, if we do a couple of months <laughs> and that's it. You yeah, know? you don't. Yeah. Need, you need retire. a year. You get a year and you can retire, right? <laughs> or you can fund your lab or whatever. <laughs> All right, that's immune number nine. You can find it at Apple Podcasts, microbe.tv slash immune. If you have a phone, 
that you're addicted to <laughs> or a tablet. <laughs> you know, on it is a program or an app that you use to listen to podcasts. And you can just search for Immune and uh, subscribe because you'll get every episode as we release them. There's only one a month, so it's not going to clog up your phone. And we'll appreciate having a subscriber. It helps us a lot. And if you really like what we do, consider supporting us financially. Go to microbe.tv slash contribute. Today's episode was presented by Cindy Leifer, who's at Cornell University. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you. Steph Langle from Ohio State University. Thank you, Steph. Thank you. Stephanie is Stephanie Langle on Twitter, and Cindy is Cindy Leifer on Twitter. <laughs> and I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws or P-R-O-F-V-R-R on Twitter. Music on Immune is by Steve Neal. His work is at stevenealpercussion.com. Thanks for listening to Immune, the podcast that's infectious. We'll be back next month.